Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's good to see you all. Welcome graduates, family, friends, alumni, faculty, and staff to the 2022 Class Day Exercises. Woo! <laughs> My name is Manatala Banasi, or Manat, and I'm so humbled to serve as the first marshal of the class of 2022. Now, oh, thank you. <laughs> now, before we get started, I do have a disclaimer. If you see any tears up here, I may or may not have forgotten to take my allergy pill this morning. So it's either allergies or it's tears of joy, but we'll have to see. Um, it's truly incredible to be all together here in person for class day for the first time since 2019, which was most of our first years. We've all, yeah, I know, what an applause, absolutely. <laughs> We've all endured so much hardship in one way or another over the last four years for so many of us, the bulk of our Harvard experiences. But we're here, thanks to the support of Harvard's faculty and staff to making this a safe and happy celebration this week for all of us to remember. And today, in this place, on behalf of all of us, I would like to acknowledge country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of Harvard Yard, the Massachusetts people on whose traditional territory we meet, and their elders, past, present, and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the Nipmuc and Wampanoag people who Harvard has had a long historical relationship with, and I would like to acknowledge all other elders who are here today. We are honored and sustained by your presence. Today is a really special day for a number of reasons. We've come full circle to the chairs where we all sat when we started our Harvard journey, the same chairs where we were all sitting with our first year entryways, anxiously and excitedly awaiting what the next years would bring, and probably on the verge of passing out, because if I remember correctly, it was about 90 degrees that day, so I'm grateful for the cool weather that we have this week for our celebration. But unlike that day, today we know the yard like the back of our hands, we look around and see more familiar faces than not, and we're closing one chapter instead of starting one. And those years have brought each of us so much, a place to call home, friends and mentors alike, new academic and extracurricular pursuits, and so much more. And to me, perhaps the most spectacular part of the last few years has been not just what is learned inside Seaver or Emerson, but what's also learned outside of the classroom, in the dining halls, in our house courtyards, Elliot's in particular, shout out Elliot, during our club meetings, and so on. What Harvard has helped each of us do is better know and understand the people and the places that surround us in the world. We've all gained a clearer and more intentional sense of the impact that we want to make and the change that we want to enact. And it is an enormous privilege. What Harvard has done best is help us build a toolkit, a toolkit to learn about the things that we care for and to make a difference in them. Class of 2022, thank you for so many years full of so many memories and love together. Our years may not have been side by side physically on campus, but they've always been and will continue to be connected in spirit. I would also like to thank the 2022 class committee, who's all sitting up here, as well as the Harvard Alumni Association, the Harvard College Fund, specifically our staff liaisons, John Prince and Molly Stanzik, who are somewhere around here for their... Yeah. for their generous energy and time in making our senior year and all the years ahead of us such a special time for us. I'd also like to give a little shout out and thank my family, who I'm grateful is here with us today, right over here, I see them. I wasn't sure I'd be able to see them. <laughs> um, like the parents of so many of our classmates, they have really supported me and shared so much love throughout my own Harvard journey. And like the parents of so many in our class as well, my parents immigrated to the US with dreams of their children growing and learning at places like Harvard. So now we're here. Thank you guys. <laughs> we'll forever be bonded together as a class full of grit and light. The ebbs and flows of the last four years have really proven it. As you exit this chapter and enter your next, I hope that you will ask yourself, how can I push the world around me forward just a little bit each day? Then I hope that you'll take the tools and experiences that Harvard has given you and run with them. If we all find the answer to that question as often as we can, I think that we'll always be connected by the magic that we shared together here and what we built with it. And now I have the pleasure of introducing someone very special to our class and to the college, whose Instagram we all check daily to see if we've made an defining figure in our class's transformative journey. Please give a warm welcome to the Danoff Dean of Harvard College, Marvin Bauer Professor of Leadership Development at Harvard Business School, and Professor of Sociology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Dean Rakesh Karana.
Thank you, Manat. Um, and thank you, senior class committee. You guys are amazing. So, good afternoon, seniors. <laughs> so, um, when you packed up to leave campus in March of your sophomore year, none of us could have anticipated the rocky path that we were about to walk to reach this moment together. But here we are, and I am so grateful to be here with all of you for the first in-person class day since 2019. So tomorrow is a solemn day. You will be taking part in a 370-year-old tradition. One of my predecessor deans described tomorrow as follows, and I quote, commencement ceremonies are wonderfully ritualistic, full of incantation, and free of explanation. So in other words, it's supposed to be self-explanatory, so thank you and good luck. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So let me give you a quick preview. So during the commencement exercises, President Bacow will confer the degrees upon the university's graduates. First, the PhD and master's degrees will be called. Then, the professional schools will be acknowledged in the reverse order of their founding dates. The deans will make a brief case for each of their school's graduates. Each school will offer its own cheers and be waving some symbolic totem in the air. And then, finally, the most important moment of the entire ceremony will occur. The college, as the oldest and original part of this university, will be called forth. And then we will get a chance to top them all. We will remind them of the power of our past and the possibilities of our future. So we're going to make some noise tomorrow, right? Right? Fantastic. Then, when you settle down, I will begin with salutations to President Bacow, the fellows of the Harvard Corporation, and the Board of Overseers. After these salutations, I will announce that you have fulfilled the faculty's requirements for the first degrees in arts and sciences, which you will have because it's my responsibility to make sure you did. Um, so please don't get in trouble. Um, and then finally, I will pronounce, and I quote, each candidate stands ready to advance knowledge, to promote understanding, to serve society. In other words, I will pronounce that you have fulfilled the mission of Harvard College and are ready to go forth and become the citizens and citizen leaders of our society. Your families and loved ones will cheer and their hearts will be bursting with pride for you. So today, I was gonna to talk to you about the past two years, about the challenges you faced and the obstacles you overcame, about the strange experience of leaving Harvard so abruptly and returning to a changed yet familiar campus, about who we all were in spring 2020 and who we became by spring 2022, but I decided against it. I was gonna to talk to you about the pandemic, about the lessons we learned and those that we did not learn, about the inequalities that were laid bare and the many losses we suffered, but I decided against it. Not because these are not important issues, but because today is a day to look forward, not back. And with that in mind, I wanna to talk to you about Harvard in 2036. In 2036, Harvard will mark its 400th anniversary. We will all be in our mid-30s, <laughs> One of you may be sitting up here preparing to address the class of 2036. Imagine that day. It's a warm and sunny day like today. The yard is buzzing. Tens of thousands of alumni are descending to celebrate our university whose basic idea for 400 years has been to educate the citizens and citizen leaders for our society. This 2036 is a moment of reflection and relief. Around 2022, we recognized that humanity was at a crossroads. We recognized that by our own actions around climate change and nuclear weapons, 
we had become a grave danger to ourselves and to our planet. We came together and we changed. And so in this 2036, climate change is under control. Solar and wind converted into electricity have become the backbone of our energy systems. Nuclear war is no longer a looming threat. Sometime around 2022, we recognize that humans, humanity's diversity is its strength and a source of infinite possibility. We realize that the world's most important resource is its youth. And so society prioritized the needs and education of young people. Back in 2022, we grew impatient with destructive politics that had become the norm, and we began to help each other. People began to communicate differently. We developed new words and reclaimed old ones, words like commitment, citizenship, generosity, compassion, kindness, good faith were no longer subject to ridicule and irony. Friendship replaced networking. Innovators, some of whom were members of your class, found ways to use online platforms differently to convey complex and subtle ideas instead of outrage and anger and frustration. Physical, economic, cultural, and social transformations came from all over between 2022 and 2036, and some of it could be traced to Harvard and to you. And all of us thrived because of it. Right now, this vision of 2036 sounds not just unrealistic, but maybe naive and unattainable, especially as we continue to grapple with the pandemic, with gun violence, with new threats to democracy, to human rights, to the very idea of a functioning society. My colleague, Rosabeth Moss Cantor, has said that, quote, everything looks like a failure in the middle. Indeed, we are in the middle of a difficult time. I've spent some time these past few weeks talking to some of you about the world you are going into. You reminded me that in your brief lifetime, there have been 2.5 global financial crises, each described as once in 100 year events. You shared concerns about our political discourse, racism, reproductive rights, failing, feeling safe in schools, grocery stores, and places of worship. You shared anxiety about climate change, global civil war and the next pandemic, and about how we could even know where to begin, where to start to start solving these problems. It's no wonder that a hopeful vision of 2036 seems out of our grasp. I will not stand here and tell you that I know how we get from where we are today to 2036. I don't. But we're going to have to find a way. You are graduating into a world in desperate need of a bridge between the present and that more hopeful future. And you are being called to build that bridge. Whether you realize it or not, you are already an experienced class of bridge builders. And I have already seen glimpses of the bridges that you are building to our future. When you left campus in 2020, I was in awe of the way your class bridged across time and space. You carried Harvard with you to locations around the world. You connected with each other by creating check-ins at the start of your extracurricular meetings to make sure people were doing okay, and by modeling vulnerability and authenticity in your interactions. You reached out to recently graduated alumni and some not recently graduated alumni for advice, and you connected with our first years and brought them into our organizations and into our space. As your lives at home and at Harvard merged, you renewed connections with family members and friends while keeping your blocking groups together through regular Zoom calls and playing online games. You experimented with ways to keep a community going on Zoom to figure out what worked and what didn't. Netflix parties, they worked. Virtual dance parties, not so much. Those of you who stayed close to campus bike to campus to hold outdoor rehearsals. You sat on the steps of Widener eating with your friends at a comfortable social distance and used the week's bridge to rehearse dance steps over the Charles. As campus reporters, you bridged by reporting on what was happening at Harvard. When we came back to campus this fall, you built new bridges. 
As the class with the most experience of the college before the pandemic, you understood the strengths and limitations of the pre-pandemic Harvard culture and what needed to be rescued, renewed, and retired. You brought people and resources together to help us rebuild our in-person community. You returned to the Cambridge and Boston communities as volunteers. Some of you ran for local office and won. You imagined a new type of student government. Too soon? Sorry. <laughs> You connected with off-cycle students and forged new friendships. In your thesis research and in the classroom, you asked difficult questions and took time to answer them. You engaged with each other even when you disagreed. In a challenging year, you created bridges by connecting one-on-one -on -one rather than relying on social media, by caring about each other and by listening to each other, by dropping the keyboard. You are bridge builders, and bridges do more than connect. Bridges span. Bridges inspire, bridges create possibilities. They are among the greatest wonders of the world. I don't know how we will get from here to 2036, but I do know that social change begins with bridge builders, and I know that you are all ready to step into that role. Building bridges requires patience and perseverance, and you will confront many obstacles along the way, just as you have over the past few years. Bridges are the product of many interconnected steps taken by many different people working together. There's something we can only do together, not alone. The process sometimes begins with a single cord anchored to distant shores. Over time, the cords are wound into cables, the cables connect spans and platforms for the great bridges of the world, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Rialto, Sydney Harbor, Hangzhou, or the Golden Gate. I believe that all of you have it inside of you to be the people who lay the foundations for the bridges of our future needs, to be the people who throw the first lines that become the cords of the bridges that will connect us to a better future. I will miss you so, so much. And may that light that emanates from each of you continue to shine and illuminate the world. Semper Veritas. Thank you so much for that, Dean Carana. My name is Alicia Vernell Rivera, and I serve as the secretary for the class of 2022. It is my honor to introduce our next speaker, Allison Mendenhall, college class of 1990, and an alum of the Graduate School of Design, where she received her master's in landscape architecture in 1999. Allison is the incoming president of the Harvard Alumni Association, a university-wide and global alumni network. Allison will be the director of strategic initiatives at Sasaki and recently held the position of principal and director of legacy design at the design workshop. Before her role as vice, first vice president of the Harvard Alumni Association, Allison has volunteered for Harvard in many ways. She was the chair of the Harvard Graduate School of Design Alumni Council and served as vice president of university-wide alumni affairs and as a graduate school director on the HAA Board of Directors. Please join me in welcoming Allison Mendenhall. Thank you so much, Alicia, for that warm introduction. Class of 2022, I am so honored to share this day with you and your families and to celebrate your hard work and your accomplishments. As the incoming president of the Harvard Alumni Association and on behalf of the more than 400,000 Harvard alumni around the world, congratulations. <laughs> As you sit here today in Tercentenary Theater, I'm sure you're reflecting on the past four years of your college experience, remembering your first year dorm, studying in the Widener stacks, passing through Stever's arched entrance, or joining friends for meals in Annenberg. 
32 years after my class day, I am in a reflective mode also. I remember sitting on the Widener steps the day after I learned I had been admitted with a newly purchased Harvard sweatshirt and a coot bag by my feet. Canada A, my Harvard Yard home before I moved to Dunster House, is just behind Memorial Church. It's natural for our minds to jump to these buildings, these spaces that contain so many vivid memories. Harvard is filled with hallowed halls of social and intellectual enrichment, where some days you might be boosted by a captivating lecture or an enlightening reading, and other days worn down by lack of sleep or maybe anxiety over a deadline. As a landscape architect, I see space differently. The ground you're sitting on, crisscrossed by paths, connects the buildings around the frame. Imagine Tercentenary Theater without these trees that form a ceiling above us, their green canopies filtering the sunlight and towering above so that our views across are not impeded. In winter, their gray-brown branches form a tangled layer of texture that is equally beautiful. This landscape isn't just the leftover space in between the more important buildings. The landscape is the connective tissue holding everything together, adding nuance and enhancing our memories of Harvard. A few years after graduating, I read an article about an effort to refine the Harvard Yard landscape. Over the years, well-meaning crews had planted shrubs around the bases of the dorms, but that was found not to be historically accurate, so they were being ripped out. Concern about the age of the trees triggered a replanting effort so that new trees would eventually grow in to fill the inevitable holes in the canopy. Most of the trees at that time were elms, which are susceptible to disease. And realizing that a homogeneous collection was vulnerable and could be wiped out entirely, Harvard, with the guidance of a landscape architect, I might add, planted more diverse tree species to add a richness to the yard ecosystem and to make it more sustainable. Just as the buildings are designed and maintained to last for centuries and loom large in our Harvard experience, so too is this special landscape that helps us to experience the campus as a whole. Tomorrow you will be celebrated in this designed landscape, this yard, and welcomed into the diverse and global alumni community. Moving forward, you won't be in this physical space as much as uh, the last four years perhaps, but you will be part of a new type of connective tissue, the network of Harvard alumni around the world. Of course, you are the remarkable class of 2022. You're part of a cohort and you have a special bond. I hope you will attend your reunions and maintain your friendships. But I also hope that you will think expansively about the alumni community that is ready to embrace you. 400,000 is a big number, but it is made up of individual alumni that span graduation, decades and disciplines, schools and geographies. They are a diverse smorgasbord that I invite you to sample when you are ready. While I'm still very close to my roommates, and I even married a classmate, I didn't engage as an alum until two decades after graduating from Harvard College and 10 years after receiving my master's degree from the Graduate School of Design. But Harvard was there for me when I was ready. The HA works to engage alumni with intention, to strengthen the alumni community, and to ensure that its diverse members are included and feel that they belong. Like a well-designed space, we are building community with purpose. For this reason, my theme for the coming year is community by design. As newly minted alumni, you are invited to join the Harvard Alumni Association for the inaugural Harvard Alumni Day. It's next Friday, June 3rd. Whether you return back to the very seat you're in today or you join via the live stream. This is a university-wide global event honoring alumni impact, citizenship, and community. It will be a wonderful celebration of our connective tissue as alumni of one Harvard. The HAA has strong traditions. After all, it was founded in 1840 with John Quincy Adams as the first president. But it is always innovating and looking for new ways to build and strengthen an inclusive community. 
Congratulations, Class of 2022, and welcome to the HAA. Thank you so much, Allison. And good afternoon, Harvard College Class of 22. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Abby Forbes, and I'm a resident of Adams House and one of your Class of 22 gift marshals. And it's my privilege to share with you today the results of our Class of 22 senior gift campaign. But before I do, I want to give a special shout out to the 100 plus volunteers on our Class of 22 committee who were absolutely instrumental in raising awareness about our senior gift campaign over the past semester, but especially the past six weeks. We are so excited to share that nearly 250 seniors made a gift to the Harvard College Fund during our campaign. In addition, I'd also like to say thanks to the generous members of the Class of 2017 who provided the funds for our community challenge. Together, our class's contributions to the Harvard College Fund unlocked an additional $20,000 from the challenge grant that will be used to support all aspects of the Harvard College student experience, from classroom to table to, close to my heart, financial aid. We are so grateful for our class's participation and we're especially proud of our collective impact and support of the students who will take our place. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Toy. I'm a resident of Cabot House and one of your, <laughs> and one of your class of 2022 gift marshals. Uh, to echo Abby, thank you to the volunteers and donors who contributed to our senior gift campaign. Our gifts to the College, Harvard College Fund are put to use immediately and in full to directly support what makes Harvard unique and special to all of us. This includes Harvard's commitment to financial aid, cornerstone academic programs, including the libraries and first year seminars, the arts and athletics teams, brain breaks, and exciting new initiatives that rely on funding for innovation. As we join the alumni community tomorrow, we hope to continue this tradition of coming together as a class to sustain and improve the Harvard experience for future generations of students. Thank you, and congratulations to all graduating seniors. Hi, all. My name is Abhishek Malani. I'm a proud resident of Forzheimer House, and, and I'm one of your program marshals for the class of 2022. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Andrew Yoon, our Harvard orator. Andrew is a thoughtful and talented person I hope all of you had a chance to meet at Harvard. He's a genius statistics concentrator, an able photographer, and a valued teaching fellow in the myriad of courses he's taught. His friends call him the glue of their blocking group. He organizes their dinners, morning golf outings, and who knows what else. But Andrew's family motto is to live honestly and be happy. And I can truly say he's embodied this throughout the past four years. Without further ado, Please join me in welcoming a lifelong learner, a beloved friend, someone I'm proud to know, Andrew Yoon. The last time I talked to my grandfather was in the summer of 2018, when we were in the back of a cab headed to the hospital for his chemotherapy. He didn't know much about Harvard, but he understood enough to know that it was a really good school, so he congratulated me on my acceptance. He told me that when he was young, his parents could not afford to send him to middle school, so he asked his uncle if he could sell one of his cows to help pay for school fees. But in response, his uncle had scolded him, asking if this was how poorly he was raised. Throughout my time at Harvard, I often reflected on this story. And each time, it has reminded me to deeply appreciate the academic opportunities that I'm lucky enough to enjoy at this institution 
and has given me a renewed sense of purpose in my personal and academic endeavors. My grandfather sadly passed away the following spring before I got to see him again. But I wish he was with us here today, seated next to my parents and watching me speak, to rest assured that his story stays with me. As we all graduate tomorrow, I think it's important for us to take a moment and reflect on what Harvard means to each of us. Our class most certainly shares lasting moments and iconic experiences in our communal memory. But at the same time, one of the best things about our class is that our backgrounds are so diverse, our interests so multidimensional, and our accomplishments so vast that the Harvard experience must have been different for each and every one of us. And I want to take this opportunity to share what Harvard means to me. For me, Harvard will be remembered as a patchwork of random idiosyncratic moments, some filled with laughter and others filled with stress and fatigue. I'll remember the day in our freshman year when they gave out a ton of lobsters here in Harvard Yard. <laughs> and how on that day, I struck up a conversation with a group of boys in front of Thayer who would later become my blockmates. I'll remember the cold night walks along the streets of the square on the way back to our rooms. And one of us inevitably calling out, yo, have face? <laughs> I'll remember the direct chats on Zoom that kept us together during the pandemic and the chills from realizing that I was not muted this entire time. <laughs> It'll be the fist bumps and the hey, what's ups on the walk back from class the sudden burst of hysterical laughter at 3 a.m. in the dining hall during a group PSET session, and the changing colors of the trees in the yard letting us know that another semester had flown by. Next time you get a chance, take a moment and find the snapshots that define Harvard in your own memory. Some of them you may share with others, and some of them may be unique to you. Some of them may make you smile, while others may make you wince. Whatever they are, I ask that you cherish those memories and keep them safe, as they are the fiber of the connection between all of us. They are what makes us a community even after we graduate. For me, Harvard has really felt like the frontier. And when I say frontier, I mean that both the students and the faculty at the school are leaders, innovators, pioneers in so many different aspects of society with ideas that have and are continuing to change the world. I learned as much about entrepreneurship from my class with Professor Josh Lerner at the business school as I did from my conversations with my friend Michael, who founded a healthcare startup while, college, while in college. I learned about the history of race relations in America from my class with Professor Louis Menand, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, but also from my friend Winona, who, during her gap year, traveled to all 50 states and interviewed more than 150 people about their race and identity. In our negotiation and conflict management class, Professor Shapiro asked us to raise our hands and suggest how we would advise uh, the president of Ecuador during the country's border conflict with Peru, then proceeded to open the classroom door and let former President Mohuat in. He told us, you can tell him directly. These are the moments that showed me that Harvard truly is a special place, one where you can learn from and study with some of the world's brightest and most driven individuals. It is my hope that we graduate from here incredibly inspired and motivated to further push that frontier. But for me, Harvard was also a terribly lonely place at times when denied from clubs, rejected from internships, or even harshly graded on exams, it was hard not to feel suffocated by the amount of talent and competition that surrounded me. I felt like I couldn't reach out to anyone at Harvard because they were my direct competitors in some sense. And I also felt like I couldn't reach out to anyone at, uh, outside of Harvard because they were often surprised that I was at Harvard and still complaining about it. But looking back, it is during these dark moments that I grew the most as a person. I learned to cope with failures, tolerate imperfections, 
and develop the courage to openly admit that I'm far worse at so many things compared to my peers. And it is only when I finally chose to be honest about my shortcomings that I realized that amidst the fierce competition, Harvard also has deep networks of support and care for those willing to seek them out. For me, there was Professor Levitsky, Professor Blitzstein, Jita, and Manuel. There was my friend Sophia, my friend Sue, and of course, my blockmates in McKinlock D401. In that spirit, I want to thank all the professors who are willing to sit down and get to know us. I want to thank all the teaching staff, without whom many problem sets will be left unsolved and many arguments left unfinished. I want to thank all the advisors, tutors, proctors, deans, who all guided us towards tomorrow's finish line. And most importantly, I want to thank each and every one of you for being supportive friends for someone else in our class. While Harvard may be characterized by the incredible talent of its people, I think it's important for us to remember that above all, we must be kind. For me, graduating from Harvard is an achievement, not just for me, but for my family. Today, as I reflect on my grandfather's story once more, I am again reminded that attending Harvard was an opportunity given to me by the persistence and drive from many generations of my family. So, I want to end by saying thank you on behalf of our class to all the family and friends who are with us here today. You are a big part of what Harvard means to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that wonderful speech and inspiring message. Hi, everyone. My name is Arjun Prasad, and it is my pleasure to serve as one of the program marshals for the class of 2022. Today, it's our distinct honor to introduce the recipients of the Richard Glover and Henry Russell Ames Memorial Award. The class of 22 comprises of countless individuals who have dedicated their college careers to serving others, both in and out of the Harvard community. That being said, the great paradox of leadership is that their efforts often go unacknowledged. As such, the purpose and spirit of the Ames Award is to finally shine a light on two unsung heroes for the class of 22. My name is Sherelle Samuel, the 2022 Class Committee Treasurer. <laughs> on June 19, 1935, Richard Glover Ames and Henry Russell Ames, brothers and Harvard students, gave their lives to save their father, who was washed overboard during a storm off the coast of Newfoundland. Every year since, the Ames Award has been given in their memory to recognize two members of the graduating class who have shown energy in helping others and who exhibit the same heroic character and leadership as the Ames Brothers. The selection committee received a large number of nominations from faculty, faculty deans, tutors, coaches, and fellow students. I have the privilege of introducing the first of our two honorees. This winner has dedicated their college life to service on community and administrative levels. As the president and chair for the board of trustees of the Phillips Brooks House Association, as well as a director for the Boston Refugee Youth Enrichment Program, they have devoted their time to positions focused on making a change. However, it's not their leadership positions we are celebrating today, but rather their constant drive to make an impact everywhere they went. As is written on Dexter Gate right back there, I think it's fair to say that this winner did not wait to leave Harvard to better serve their country and their kind. Despite the challenge of the pandemic, this winner used their creative mind to keep PBHA afloat and to ensure that all students and families in their program stayed supported. By building relationships with the Boston public school system, they were able to make sure students were receiving their resources that, that they needed to succeed both in school as well as in their after school programs. This included securing iPads and Chromebooks as well as stable internet access to all students in need. Apart from making sure that they all serviced the communities that they supported, this recipient also managed all of the internal structures of PBHA, keeping the organization as strong as ever. As we began in-person activities, this winter facilitated the move away from Zoom, managing upwards of 900 in-person volunteers. They continued on to host anti-racism workshops for the PBHA leadership 
to strengthen the organization's DEI and anti-oppression agenda. It is clear that this winner has dedicated their college career to the service of others, truly making an impact. Please join me in welcoming the first of our AIMS winners to the stage, Farah Afifi. Farah, if you're here, you can come up and get your award. It is with distinct honor and excitement that I introduce the second recipient of this year's Ames Award. Our second awardee is not only a leader in our class, but is known as one of the most humble and unrecognized leaders in our year. They have been a crucial member of every community and space that they have occupied. Within their house, they are known as one who has gone out of their way to, know, to learn the names of the dining hall staff, even the less visible people. You will always be greeted by this individual with a smile. They have learned the names and stories of various house team tutors and deans. I am told that their presence will be missed dearly from their house next year. Despite their dedication to others and their sixth course load, this recipient has also shown tremendous leadership on their team. This nominee has pushed their teammates both on and off the field, aiding them in moments of success and prompting them to have difficult conversations and form necessary relationships that others would probably evade. From first year, they have been instrumental in creating the long-lasting, close-knit African community serving in multiple leadership positions on the Harvard African Student Association's board. It has been said that their reach is unlimited. They are involved in a range of spaces, groups, academic and extracurricular communities. They take people as they are, always making them feel welcomed, seen, and heard. Their generosity, eagerness, and ability to create community truly has no bounds. They are a humble leader who has created an astounding impact. This individual also happened to be a member of my first year entryway, shout out Hollis North. <laughs> Please join me in a much deserved congratulations to our second Ames Award recipient, Jordan Mubako. Hi everyone, my name is Nia Fernandez and I'm a program marshal for the class of 2022. Thank you. Next, Yumna Melhem Chamier will deliver the Ivy Oration as she reflects on our journey here at Harvard with both levity and humor. The pride of Adams House and the Lowell Dining Hall, Yumna is a woman of many interests and talents, including dancing, defending headbands as an unironic fashion choice, and even defying the laws of science by somehow getting COVID three times this year. <laughs> Yumna is French and Lebanese and grew up in Paris, which is a better conversation starter than I'll ever have. 
Now, as an avid member of organizations before the pandemic, which I think we all can relate to, Yumna says she has since taken the self-care route and describes herself as objectively lazy. <laughs> However, I think I speak for all of us in saying her accomplishments prove otherwise. From working on a novel to having her work published in British Vogue, the Harvard Human Rights Review, and even that one bathroom stall in Adams, <laughs> Yumna has made great impact through her writing. She hopes to go on to write for film, television, and literary magazines, adding a creative spin to all that she does. With a love and gift for combining humor and storytelling, I couldn't be more excited to introduce my new friend and our Ivy orator, Yumna Melham Shamier. Fellow students, proud parents, esteemed faculty, and random people who just watch these things on YouTube. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Younger siblings, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, I don't know exactly what this means, but I thought you guys should start getting ready to receive unearned patronizing advice from us from this day forward. <laughs> Some of you are probably looking up at this stage right now and thinking, who is this stone-cold hottie, and how does she have such amazing hair? <laughs> well, that's Mayor Michelle Wu. <laughs> and I hope she'll address this in her remarks. <laughs> Writing the speech was tough, because, let's face it, this is Harvard. A place where dreams are narrowed down to slightly more lucrative dreams. <laughs> a place that reminds us that in this country, you can be accepted into the world's most illustrious academic institution through the sweat of your own brow, just like your old man and his old man before him. <laughs> a place that meets 100% of financial need for all students. This one has no punchline, it's just an amazing thing. Thanks, Daddy Harvard. <laughs> but yeah, writing this speech was tough, which is why I wrote it the same way I wrote all my assignments as a senior, not hungover, not buried in Lamont basement, and not late last night between the hours of 3 and 7 a.m. My diligence and rigor over the course of the last four years are much like the millions Jeffrey Epstein donated to Harvard. They have aged very well. <laughs> but... <laughs> it's thanks to not doing any of these things that I can confidently begin by saying congratulations, class of 2022. All of us are here today because this is the location that was chosen. <laughs> Some of us are also technically here because we were driven by the relentless fear of disappointing our parents, and I will now give you guys a few seconds to share an awkward look filled with unprocessed resentment and reluctant gratitude. <laughs> today is all about us the class of 2022, a class known by many as the greatest class by far, the Harvard of classes, if you will, or in the words of David Malin, the David Malin of classes. <laughs> We're a pretty unique class. For one thing, college was interrupted by the pandemic, which means that we're something of a hybrid group. I, for instance, was initially in the class of 2021, and it's too late to kick me off the stage. <laughs> the pandemic presented us with singular challenges, not only when we were studying online, but also when we came back. Our social ineptitude could no longer be guised as the new normal and decidedly reverted to being the usual weird. 
We could no longer mute Section Kid, though if Section Kid was us, this was a sensational development. <laughs> And worst of all, we had to hear about everybody's gap years, including the people who, like, really found themselves in India, bro. <laughs> and unfortunately came back to tell us about it. <laughs> Still, we made it. Tomorrow, we graduate from Harvard. Four years ago-ish, we finally arrived on this beautiful campus, excited and a little nervous. We'd written our application essays about our plans to pursue lives of service and save some turtles. And those of us who just wanted to make bank had written about our plans to pursue lives of service and save some turtles. <laughs> we'd written about the struggles we'd faced and the sacrifices our families had made in the hopes of one day sending us to an institution such as this one. And those of us with neither struggles nor sacrifices had written about our great, great Aunt Helen, who crossed the Mediterranean one-legged in the late 1800s in a brave defiance of leprosy that was absolutely related to our involvement in the high school swim team. <laughs> But Harvard saw something in each of us. If there are two words that could sum up the four years that ensued, they would be transformative experience. A sentence Dean Karana bribed me to say earlier today. <laughs> But he was right. The time we spent here really did transform each of us. In my case, I am now a person who needs a job, whereas four years ago, I was just a person. <laughs> Everyone's experience here has been unique, starting with the different concentrations we pursued and the stereotypes attached to them. Economics concentrators like to joke that they're snakes, and the rest of us like to pretend that we haven't heard that joke every single day since we started college. But honestly, I think that label's unfair. Why should only one concentration get assigned an animal? So I took the liberty of coming up with a few others. Social studies concentrators, you get the blowfish. You are actually incredibly intelligent creatures, but nobody realizes that because you were given such a stupid name. <laughs> Women, gender, and sexuality studies concentrators, you get the Chacoan peccary because academia only acknowledged your existence in the mid-1970s, and the average person is still likely to deny that you're a real thing. Government concentrators, you guys are humans. Humans who play lacrosse. <laughs> And finally, pure math concentrators, you are the three turkeys that make intermittent appearances in Harvard Yard. We know you're there, but you've only been, out been sighted outside twice. <laughs> It's okay, guys, I can make that joke because I'm a pure math concentrator. I'm not, I just needed to get that on camera for the purposes of my job search. <laughs> Regardless of what we studied, the one thing all our Harvard journeys probably had in common, as Andrew said, was the experience of rejection. We got rejected from on-campus publications, musical groups, clubs, and the semi-secret, hyper-exclusive group that calls final clubs, finals clubs. <laughs> We got rejected from classes, internships, leadership positions, the Harvard Undergraduate Clean Energy Group, the Harvard Undergraduate Clean Energy Group again, the Harvard Undergraduate Clean Energy Group a third time? Seriously, guys, what is it? Is it my vibe? Ultimately, the only place that I can safely say rejected none of us was also the only place that I can safely say all of us wanted to be rejected from. The UC's mailing list. <laughs> Now, I'll be honest, some failures hurt more than others. The ones where we did everything right, put in the time, put in the work, and it still didn't work out. For instance, I dedicated the entirety of the last four years to roaming the yard aimlessly in Harvard sweatpants, lanyard, and keychain, with an improbable smile on my face and a large donut in each hand, and I still didn't get featured on Dean Karana's Instagram. <laughs> a 
until yesterday's procession when Dean Karana ruined this punchline by randomly posting me on his Instagram. <laughs> but I don't want to go too hard on you, Harvard. Remember when we were writing our applications, saying how badly we wanted to be here, how amazing we thought this place was? In a way, Harvard is our long-term girlfriend. In the courtship stages, back when nothing was guaranteed, we told Harvard that we loved the way it thinks and that it was not like other schools. <laughs> and now we're four years in, like, you put the toilet seat back up. <laughs> except the toilet seat is actually divesting from fossil fuels. <laughs> I almost wish there was a physical image to represent that dynamic of groveling at the school's feet while we were applying and then proceeding to urinate all over it, like eager, aspiring prefrosh rubbing the foot of the John Harvard statue for good luck or something, and then accepted students, I don't know, peeing on it, drunk. Of course, the girlfriend analogy leaves out a lot. Namely, that Harvard also played something of a parental role. Our freshman year, they demanded that the yard be dry, no alcohol, which was basically Harvard saying, as long as you're under my roof, you live by my rules. Then we moved into our upperclassmen houses where we had drinks, parties, and even free condoms. And that was Harvard saying, if you're gonna do it anyway, I'd rather you do it in the house. <laughs> and finally, just this month, Harvard reminded us not to complete the celebrated tradition of jumping off the Weeks Bridge for our own safety, thereby becoming the first parental figure to say, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? And have, yeah, actually be a realistic answer. But now, Harvard won't be parenting us anymore. It's time for that infamous place, the real world. Get ready for an endless series of you went to Harvard, which will either mean that you said something really stupid or that you are hot. <laughs> the class of 2022 will go on to work in all sorts of fields and industries. Some of us will become doctors, teachers, firefighters, astronauts, detectives, and all the other jobs I totally know about as a grown adult. Those of us who spend a little too much time on LinkedIn are guaranteed to become data-driven thought leaders, passionate domain experts, or even creative self-starters. <laughs> and finally, some of us will also probably become villains, because that's just plain statistics. <laughs> Either way, out there in the real world, our first challenge is going to be learning to speak normally again. No more elaborate academic jargon, no more weird Harvard inside jokes. FET will no longer be a beloved Elliott House tradition, but rather the acronym for federal excise tax. <laughs> the brothers will go back to being a term people use to refer to their actual male siblings. And finally, perhaps most difficult of all, a 15-minute walk will no longer be the punchline to quad-related quips, but rather a truly standard amount of time for walking from one place to another. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you may be thinking, but Yumna, how will I signal to everybody I meet out there that I went to Harvard if I let go of all of that? Well, you can always tell them that you went to college in Massachusetts near Boston or in the Boston area. They'll figure it out. <laughs> All right, most of what I've said during the speech has been with the goal of giving us a little laugh on this memorable day. But before I go, I would like to share with my class my main takeaway from Harvard, which has been this. Let's not take life too seriously. Let's laugh at ourselves, at the successes and failures which we'll be bound to encounter, and let's laugh at institutions, especially powerful or intimidating ones like Harvard. Just not actual Harvard, because they haven't technically given us our diplomas yet. <laughs> and with that, closing time. Class of 2022, I am so, so happy for us. 
Be proud of the four years you spent here, regardless of whether you're graduating cum laude, summa cum laude, ipso facto, or persona non grata. <laughs> There's a lot to be thankful to Harvard for. The faculty who taught us with excellence and empathy, the staff who made us feel at home since day one. Perhaps above all, I am thankful for our student body, from the recent alumni whom I can only presume are in tears as we speak, flinging darts at cardboard cutouts of their landlords, to the underclassmen who are basically at a really expensive summer camp, to us, the class of 2022, who are in a sweet spot that will last exactly three days. No matter what the real world will bring, I trust that we will march towards it with kindness, resilience, and courage of conviction, with love, an openness to laughter, and a strong moral compass, and above all, with the heavy, yet ultimately deeply important knowledge that some of you lost your virginities in a bunk bed. <laughs> Congratulations, class of 2022, and thank you so much. Thanks, Yumna. You've definitely captured our transformational experience really well. It is with this transformative experience in mind that we are excited to introduce our next speaker. Hi, everyone. My name is Fariba Mahmoud. I'm a proud resident of Winthrop House and one of your class of 2022's program marshals. Hi, everyone. I'm Karina Skunse, and I'm also a proud res resident of Winthrop House and one of the class of 2022's program marshals. Let me just move this up. <laughs> it is our great privilege to introduce this year's featured speaker, Mayor Michelle Wu. Mayor Wu made history when she became the first woman and the first person of color to be elected to lead the city of Boston when she was elected mayor of Boston in 2021. But this wasn't the first time. But this wasn't the first time that Mayor Wu made history. Mayor Wu first made history in 2013 at the young age of 28 when she was elected to the Boston City Council, becoming the first Asian American woman to serve in that role. Well respected by the fellow members of the council, she was unanimously elected in 2016 to become their president, making her the first woman of color to lead that council. Throughout her tenure, Mayor Wu has been a fierce defender of equity, inclusion, and change, centering the people and the communities that she is serving first, specifically the communities that are often underrepresented and unheard. Mayor Wu is a model of transformational leadership, advocacy, and excellence for the world. And as she has made history, shattering glass ceilings and advocating for change in 2013, 2016, and 2021, she continues that legacy today here at Harvard as the first in-person class day speaker in over three years. While Mayor Wu has shattered many glass ceilings, it is her dedication to public service and justice that has come to define her legacy. Born to Taiwanese parents and raised in Chicago, it is her own family story and experiences that have shaped the leader that she is today. Returning home after college at the age of 22, Mayor Wu found herself the guardian of her younger siblings, a support system for her mother, and the manager of their family business. Navigating complex public care and support networks, Mayor Wu saw the significance of government, and particularly city government, on families and communities, leading Mayor Wu to reshape the role of city government as a force for urgent change. From passing legislation for paid parental leave, climate resiliency, housing stability, food justice, and workers' rights, Mayor Wu has outlined a better path for Boston, its families, and its generations to come that is grounded in opportunity and justice, a legacy fitting for the revolutionary city of Boston. While Mayor Michelle Wu is certainly a force to be reckoned with, with her drive and leadership inspiring many, what connects her to us specifically, however, is our shared experience as Harvard College students. As a proud resident of Courier House, <laughs> and a concentrator in economics, she has experienced the transformative experience firsthand and knows what it is like to sit in these very seats on this very special day. 
She shows us the incredible impact that we can have on one another. Mayor Wu, thank you for being a role model and an inspiration to the Harvard class of 2022 and beyond. It is our great pleasure to welcome her back to Harvard Yard, Mayor Michelle Wu, class of 2007. Thank you both so much. Thank you for that very generous, kind introduction. Um, it feels like there's sort of a transformative experience bingo card out there that I'm going to just, I'll try to weave that in as well. And thank you, Yumna, for saving me. Um, I forgot my prepared remarks today and instead grabbed accidentally my six page hair care manual. So, one second. <laughs> Perfect humidity level today. Thank you so much, class committee, class of 2022, for inviting me to join you for this tremendous honor. When I got the invitation to be your speaker, I felt a pang of recognition from my earliest days here in the yard, looking around and wondering how I could possibly belong here. I didn't know anything about politics, wasn't a junior squash champion, hadn't written a book on astronomy, those were all my entryway mates. <laughs> and just like then, my first thought when I was asked to join you today was, what makes me qualified just six months into my new job for this incredible honor? I'm still terrible at squash. <laughs> my second thought was, actually this is kind of awkward because I had already told one of the Harvard grad schools that I wasn't available to be their graduation speaker. <laughs> True story. But I wanted to be here with you all because this is truly one of the most special events from commencement week. It's an incredible opportunity to speak with all of you in this moment. It's a moment of possibility as you reflect on all that you've been immersed in, in person and over Zoom over the last few years with those who've grown alongside you. Six months ago, I was sworn in as an unusual mayor of Boston. There's not much around that's older than Harvard, but Boston is. Founded in 1630, and until six months ago, we had never in nearly 400 years elected a woman or a person of color as mayor. And, it had been nearly a century since a Harvard College grad became mayor of Boston. But 15 years ago, I sat in your very seats. So maybe what qualifies me most of all to share some insights at class day is that I'm proof that you can go from having absolutely no idea what you want to do at class day to mayor of the greatest city on the planet. Since it's only been 15 years, I can also tell you that you likely won't remember anything from these speeches, <laughs> except for the astronomy researchers out there. You seem to remember everything. But if there is one word you might hold on to from your time here, let it be the word that's on your shiny class rings, on the sweatshirts you'll return to for comfort and coziness, the hats you've been hastily giving to family members as you dash home for the holidays over the years from the coop. Veritas. So let's go with that. My truth is, I came to Harvard for the clam chowder. <laughs> I had no grand career plans or even a clear academic passion, but I did have a lot of clam chowder at Annenberg. I'm the oldest child of immigrant parents from Taiwan. And growing up, we always ate dinner at home with chopsticks. And on the weekends, we'd all pile into the family minivan and drive over an hour to get to the Chinese grocery store that had the right vegetables and spices. But in the rare instances when we did go out for dinner, my parents would insist on old country buffet. <laughs> it's before all of your time now. But there used to be in various suburban strip malls <laughs> an all-you-can-eat buffet, where you could get as many plates as you wanted of things like mac and cheese and roast beef. They charged kids by their age, which kind of took some of the fun out of birthdays. <laughs> but for me, the highlight of the meal was always at the very end. 
after I was absolutely stuffed, I would still find room for some soft serve ice cream and a glorious bowl of clam chowder. So at Prospective Students Weekend, when I learned that there was always ice cream in the dining halls and clam chowder on Fridays, that was that. <laughs> to this day, I'm still Courier House through and through. But my truth is, I was initially disappointed about getting quadded <laughs> and confused about why our mascot was a tree when other houses had animals that were fierce and regal or at least cute. Today as mayor, I'm looking to plant tens of thousands more trees in Boston to grow our canopy, reduce urban heat island effect, and clean the air in our neighborhoods. And sometimes in meetings, I blurt out, Fear the tree! <laughs> Here's another truth. I met my future husband at Harvard Yale, and the truth is he went to Yale. <laughs> Love knows no bounds except for one. We still have never sat on the same side at the game. <laughs> And the truth is, at my commencement, I was scared. Sure, there was that slight nervousness about entering the real world, but it was more than that. A few months earlier, my mom had started to show signs of mental illness, paranoia, delusions, hearing things that no one else could hear. And in the culture and the family that I grew up in, we couldn't bring our business out to the public. I couldn't talk about it outside the family, and my mom refused to acknowledge what was happening, much less agree to seek treatment. My commencement was one of the last public events she attended before a major breakdown, and I was so worried about her and about my friends and their families noticing her strange behavior. It still took months after that for us to get her to seek treatment, and months after that, for me to be able to talk about it with my friends. It was still a truth that was too painful to share because of the stigma that we all must be a part of breaking. The truth is, among my blocking group, I was the last person anyone thought would end up in politics. But my family's challenges, my mom's journey with mental health, set me on this path. Stepping in as a caregiver to my mom, raising my sisters shortly after graduation, opening a small business, and seeing how so many of the systems we had to interact with weren't designed for people, people like my family, and also seeing that we can all have a role in fixing them. You'll hear the wise, worldly advice tomorrow at commencement morning exercises, so I'll just give three things that I've learned about Veritas in the years since leaving the yard. First, your own deep truth sets the foundation for your happiness, health, and impact. Take care of yourself. Figure out what gets you excited to wake up in the morning. And just as important, listen to your body and know when it's telling you you're not OK. Surround yourself with friends. Immerse yourself in the work that respects your truth, that feeds it and nurtures it and encourages you to be the truest and most joyful version of yourself. I need some quiet time by myself at the end of each day. With two kids, that is quite difficult. And every once in a while, I need a hike in the woods. Fear the tree. <laughs> I find my greatest meaning in building community and helping change people's perspectives on what's possible. Second, see what is truly real. There is no substitute for lived experience. Sure, you can Google almost anything now or watch a TikTok explainer video, but if you're trying to solve a problem in the world, understand what it feels like first. Seek out those closest to the challenge and those who will be most impacted by that solution. I take the tea to work because my own deep truth is that I'm a transit nerd but also because there's no better way to get expertise in transit policy than to experience the system you're trying to improve day in and day out. There will always be people who know more than you about a challenge or a solution. Seek them out and ask questions. Some 
might be sitting right next to you here today, and many are in our neighborhoods and community organizations doing the work on the ground. Third, tell the truth when it's hard. I'm not just talking about admitting to a deep love for clam chowder or even working to break the stigma on mental illness by sharing our stories. In this age of information overload and, and misinformation, curated social media feeds that tout connection often drive us further and further apart. In politics and in family and in work, speak your truth and hold true to the urgency you feel. Because fundamentally, speaking truth is the only way to build a foundation for trust. And that is what we are missing in our society and our democracy today. You know all the facts and statistics on climate risks, housing and childcare costs, our closing window of time to act. Yet from pandemic, public health, to student loan debt, basic reproductive rights and gun violence, we're having to fight through a tidal wave in this country of misinformation before we even reach the barrier of proving that our policy solutions work. To tackle the challenges we face today, we need to build trust in the urgency of our challenges by seeking the truth of the experiences of those on the ground, speaking the truth when it's hard, and building the community to solve it. We must trust in possibility, including the possibility to do the things that seem impossible, that people say are too pie in the sky or radical to be done. And Boston is a city whose history is rooted in doing just that time and time again. Today, we're proud of our many firsts. Boston is home to the first public library in the country, first public park, first public school, first subway system anywhere in the United States. But what we often forget is that the opposition to these foundational public goods that we don't give a second thought to today was once fierce and imaginative, but in all the wrong ways. Before Boston broke ground on the Red Line and Park Street Station, the first subway line in the country, business owners along Tremont Street formed the Anti-Subway League, petitioning city leaders to oppose the creation of any subway lines anywhere in the city of Boston. They collected tens of thousands of signatures from business owners and residents who were afraid. They were afraid of everything from bringing a curse upon the city by disturbing what might be underground, digging up extensive swaths of the ground and, and potentially forcing snakes living under the earth to come up to the surface and then take over all of Boston. These were actually in the, in the documents in the, the Boston archives. And today, we depend on this system. We're leading the way in public transportation's vision for a fair, free system that serves all. So to be bold and creative, harness your imagination to focus on the good we can do when we work together. And let's let go of our instincts to protect the status quo. And harness your leadership and charisma and knowledge to help others do the same so that we can all focus more on what we could create if we agreed to get our hands dirty and break ground, rather than worrying about what snakes might lurk, lurk beneath the surface. Most of all, remember, I ended up as the Green New Deal mayor of Boston due to a love of clam chowder, a reverence for trees, and a belief in possibility. Wherever you go next, take the time you need to get settled. Find the space within that place, and you can be your truest self. And if it doesn't exist, build it. I know better than to try to tell you not to do it all, but I will encourage you to find the time every now and then to just be. Lie in the sun, hug your friends, FaceTime your family and pick up their phone calls, read a few pages of a book, take care of yourself, and everyone you care for thereafter will be grateful that you did. And when you're ready, seek the truth. See what's real, what's necessary, and what's not. Think about the impact, especially for those nearest whatever issue you're trying to solve. 
but not at the expense of those on the periphery. And when you find that truth, swim through the waves of misinformation and disbelief and incredulousness and tell it. Tell the truth when it's hard and uncomfortable and complex. And to the extent that you can, hold people through it if they need to be held. But tell the truth. Tell it so that we can build and rebuild the trust that's needed for our brightest future. You can do anything. Choose to make what you do impactful, joyful, and true. We're all rooting for you, Class of 2022. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you so much, Mayor Wu, for your remarks. In a year where we've seen so much uncertainty and tragedy in the world, it's inspiring to hear from a fellow alumna who is using her voice to make a difference in the lives of so many people. We have a lot to learn from you. My name is Ruth Jane Subicat, and I am so honored to serve as the second marshal for the class of 2022. <laughs> It's been both a privilege and a joy to see this class reunite over the course of the year. And today's ceremony has been an incredible celebration of the class of 22's many accomplishments, as well as the relationships that we formed with one another. Looking around Tercentenary Theater, you could almost believe that this is a class day like any other, or that we're a graduating class like any other. Four years ago, many of us sat in these exact seats at our first year convocation. We had no idea then what the next four years at Harvard would have in store for us. And little did we know just how much was going to change in our lives and in the world. Now, in many ways, we're a very different class than the one we were in the fall of 2018. Joining us today are our friends formerly from the class of 2021, who've taken a short detour en route to graduation. We are so lucky to have had this extra year with you and to call you members of our graduating class today. We're also joined by a select few from the class of 2023 who have truly made the most of a bad situation and made the courageous decision to leave Harvard a year early for the great unknown right alongside us. So class of 2022, we may not have begun our college journeys together. And I know there are some of us out there who still have a semester left in the fall, so we may not even be ending our college journeys together. After Friday, our paths will diverge for better or for worse. Some of us will be staying here, Many of us will be in New York City, and the rest of us will be spread across the country and across the globe. But right now, for this moment in time, we're all here together. Every decision we've made, every class we've taken, every late night, every rehearsal and meeting and shuttle ride and spontaneous conversation, they've all led us right here to the people sitting around us. This is an incredibly unique and special group of people, and this moment, our graduation from Harvard is unlike any other. Thank you to everyone who's helped us along the way and who are joining us to celebrate today. Friends, family, and faculty, it's good to finally see your faces. And to the class of 2022, congratulations. I can't wait to see the incredible things that each of you does next, and I'm already looking forward to the next time we reunite, wherever and whenever that may be. To conclude our program today, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our Class Day Otists. One of the things that I've missed the most during the pandemic is performing live with other people. It's not something you can recreate virtually. So it brings me great joy that this year, our Class Ode will be performed by the Otist as well as eight others. Rena Cohen, accompanied by Angela Eichhorst, Will Granger, Joseph Griffith, Jong Tae John, Enrique Neves, Aurora Strauss, Benjamin Perry Wenzelberg, and Elizabeth Wu. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Oh, the 
transformative for years would pass. We just didn't know what that would mean. Spent our first year in bliss at the New Smith campus. Sophomore year was half here, half on Zoom. Then as juniors we waited with breath baited, would the next email from admin spell doom. We returned to Fair Harbor from homes far and near, back to late nights and invites and fun. And our senior class welcomed new friends to our year. From the class of 2021, we have tried to revive, keep traditions alive. There's been lots of rebuilding to do. But if anyone knows how to bounce back and thrive, it's the class of 2022. Thank <laughs> you.